creators and well if you haven't heard of Spotify for podcasters it's the easiest way to create and post your podcast it's free that's right it's free to download it has built in tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast on your cell phone or any smart device Spotify for podcasters also distributes your podcast on virtually any platform that streams podcasts like Spotify Amazon Music iHeartRadio Apple and Google Podcasts and much more you can even monetize your podcast with no minimum listeners Spotify for podcasters is your one stop app for podcasting remember it's free Welcome to the Trigger One and Talk podcast, where we have uncensored conversations, we exchange information, and we provide a ton of resources for the listeners and the viewers. We are produced by Penton Pending Consulting Solutions, LLC, which is my company. We are sponsored by Spotify for Podcasters. If you want to watch these episodes, you can do it in two places. Spotify, and you don't even have to buy it. You can use the free version or our YouTube channel, which is again a company named Pension Pending Consulting Solutions LLC. We are going to have a great finale to our part three with our sister Simone Nofel, who is an applied epigeneticist. She's an author and she's just a great human and a great humanitarian. We're going to be talking about, in part three, the modalities for ancestral and generational trauma. Now, part one was about Simone's story, dealing with ancestral and generational trauma. And part two, we did a tutorial on everything about ancestral and generational trauma. This last one, as we wrap this part up, is talking about what are some resolutions or modalities that one can tap into they are dealing with ancestral and or generational trauma. I want to give you just a brief overview of Simone again. She's an applied epigeneticist. She's an author. If you're not watching this podcast, you're going to be missing some of the stuff that I got on the screen here. I got her link tree. She has one-on-one empowerment sessions. Uh, there's a children's book series called Exploring the Elements that she offers. She has a self-publishing one-on-one coaching. She has a newsletter called Stay Connected. You can follow her on Clubhouse. There's uh, She's involved with the Healy. She does one-on-one frequency sessions, and she teaches you everything you need to know about Healy. Where's your device? Right here. Okay, see, y'all got to watch this because she wears it all the time. I'm telling you. She has a Freedom Frequency Master Class. You can learn from the experts about frequencies in her link tree under Just for Kids. She has a YouTube playlist called Mindfulness for Four Kids, the number four. My Superhero Foods, Raising Healthy Kids. She offers a bunch of freebie activities for kids under the affiliate Love. She offers Shop the Number Four Ocean, Sailor Oceans, and Panamat Echo, which is a massage mat. I might have to get that from Mrs. LP. Small <laughs> Nofu, what's going on with you? Ah, uh, it's going good. I had my morning walk. I did. I've been doing this uh, gratitude walk challenge, and so it's a month long challenge, and it's just bringing my awareness and my intention into everything that I'm grateful for. So that's how I've been starting my days, and so I'm doing great. I want to jump into it because when we talked last time, we we did this tutorial on everything about ancestral and generational trauma. I want us to talk about the modalities because you know how I would say we don't just do dialogue here on this podcast. We offer all kind of resolutions. And before we get started, I'm going to give everybody some disclaimers. So if you are triggered at any point during this podcast, and I mean at any point and you need help immediately, I want you to call 911 if you're in the United States. If you're in the UK, it's 999. Parts of Europe, like in Switzerland, it's 143. You're going to get mandated reporters that are going to be answering those calls from the operator that's on the call to the responders, EMS, fire, police. If you don't have an immediate need but you need help, we offer, because we cover four areas on the Trigger Want to Talk podcast, we talk about human and sex trafficking, domestic violence, sexually based offenses, and true crime. 
And under the true crime banner, we do a missing person case. And those cases are black and brown or melanated folks or non-Caucasian folks because we want to bring the same media attention and energy to those who are missing. It could be a runaway kidnapping or an abduction. We're going to be doing some true crime stories. We already have started, but we always do a missing person case at the end of every episode. person that we're going to be covering today, her name is Chan Yin Lam. She has a very interesting story, but we'll get to that at the end. So if you have issues with substance abuse, whether it be alcohol, drugs, or you're a supporter of someone who has one of those issues, we offer the numbers and websites to Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and Alamon. And finally, if you are suicidal or know somebody who's suicidal, call 988. Here in the United States, that number is available 24-7, and it's toll-free. Again, 988 for suicidal ideation and some other behavioral health and mental health resources. So long over. Let's just talk about these modalities, my dear. What say you in terms of what do you think about modalities when it comes to generational and ancestral trauma? Let's start there. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think the first thing I want to kind of start with is that in general, when we're talking about generational ancestral healing, the most powerful way to make massive shifts in your life is the collective experience. So that means if you have access to, if you feel safe to bring in members of your family um, in the process of you healing, I think that can create amazing ripple effects for your entire bloodline. So that really means if um, there's a safe person in your family, like a parent, grandparent, cousin, aunt, uncle, um, that you can make aware of the journey that you're going on and then invite them to go on that journey with you. Um, I think it's really powerful. And for me personally, that's been my experience with my mother. Um, I started my journey through self-healing. Um, and shortly after that, she also jumped on the train. Um, and so I've noticed that since she's been really intentional with her healing, um, it's created effects throughout our whole family. Um, and of course that can happen with just you, just whoever, if you're listening to this, it can happen with just you. Um, but it is really powerful to have a collective experience. Um, so I will start by saying that. Um, and then the second piece that's really important is that healing does not equal guilt or shame. And so as you're on your journey, that is such a powerful mindset shift to work with. And so if you are feeling like something um, in your past, whether it was a choice that you made or something that you were involved with that affected your family or that continued that trauma cycle, um, first to free yourself from the guilt and shame will help really get the ball rolling for your healing. Because if you're holding on to guilt and shame, that, that impacts your self-worth, your self-love, and therefore stunts the growth that you can have on your healing journey. Yeah, that's my opening my opening comments. What do you think, LP? Man, I, I'm writing all these notes down. So <clears throat> I love that. That is exactly what I would say if I came up with that. I want to talk about, because you know we deal with the stigmas and taboos and stereotypes about everything. I want you to talk about some of the stigmas and taboos and stereotypes regarding resolutions to help people deal with generational and ancestral traumas. What are some of the reasons that people are resistant to these modalities or these resolutions when it comes to specifically generational and ancestral trauma? I feel like this is such a deep, deep question, especially when we're talking about melanated people. Um, I think in our communities, the stigma just lies in mental health in general. Um, and so I think we probably touched on this prior and probably part two, we probably talked about this, um, just how like, especially with the, with the black man, right? It's like, oh, we don't cry. We don't sh show emotion. We're just strong all the time. Um, and that's so unhealthy. And so that this conditioning has gone on for your decades, decades and decades through generations of not showing your emotions. And even, even from the female side, you know, like this strong, independent black woman who don't need no man, like all this, all these things combine together to make this conditioning or programming for generations to come. And so that stigma is really deep. And so when we start talking about um, the hesitations or the blockages that people have 
from doing this work, it's because it's really hard to talk to our family members about this who might not even subscribe to the idea that we need to do work in our mental health. And so if you're on this journey alone and you're trying to involve your parents or your cousins or whatever, and they're thinking that mental health is hocus pocus and you know it's just about weakness or all that, then it's really hard to make any improvements. Um, and so I think, you know, with the, with those blockages and with those resistances, we have to, again, evaluate our belief systems. And I think that's a huge modality in itself for this type of work is just to evaluate and reassess your belief systems continually throughout your lifetime. I'm smiling because I thought about something you just said about, oh, you know, one of the things that we hear a lot is... You said, you know, I don't need no black man, you know, because I'm independent and all that. And I thought about the song uh, made by Destiny's Child, you know, that independent song. And then Jay-Z has a song where he has kind of a response to it. And one, I forget the title of the song, but one of the bars, he says, get your independent ass out of here, question. Because, you know, she kept saying question before she would say whatever the other part of the verse was. So I thought it was funny that they kind of went at each other. And I think it was more playful than anything because, you know, now they're married. You know? Well, not now, but they're married and all this stuff. So I thought it was hilarious when I when I heard that. But I want you to expound on that part of it because that's a huge thing that we see a lot in the media or on social media. And I know a lot of black women who are independent because they say, well, you know what, black men either... They are in jail, they are broke, you know, they are in the LGBTQ community, they are not being faithful, they are women beaters, they don't take care of their kids, they got too many kids, they got too many baby mamas, they got too much baby mama drama, you know, I can keep going on. But I want you to talk about that from your point of view. Yeah. So I think if you would have asked me this a few years ago, I would have been like, yeah, and so what? Like, what's wrong with that? Um, but I feel like my journey. That's all right. Hold on. See, that's why y'all need to watch this because you didn't see the visual. She did the neck moving and everything. So you got to answer this question with the neck moving. That's all, that's all I ask. <laughs> yes, it's, it's true. Like I, I've, I've been there. Like I've been in that reality where you know I didn't think I needed any other person in my life, and I was just independent. But what I found in the last several years is that there's the, there's these two energies, right? So we're we're talking about this woo woo stuff that I believe is truly scientific and real. And so we have every single human, no matter how you identify, we have masculine energy and feminine energy, and it's all about balance. And for my majority of my life, I held a lot of masculine energy. And that's where that independence piece comes from. It's like that masculine energy where I can do everything. You know, I can go in the attic and get my tools and do whatever. I don't need a man to do it. So when I started implementing feminine energetic practices and started balancing it out for myself, what I found is that, yes, I can do all the things that, you know, I could ask another dude to do. However, there's so much beauty and being taken care of and just softening up to being open to receive. And I think that's what divine femininity is really about. And there's so much healing in that, especially for women who were similar to me who held or hold a lot of masculine energy. And so when we can start making those changes to really soften up, we can see, yeah, like, yeah, I could have fixed that, but it's actually nice to have somebody do it for me. Like we should all be, um, whether we're male or female, we should all be open to receiving more, whatever that looks like for you. And so if you identify as a woman and you're a woman, then you should be open to, and this is just my you know personal opinion, you should be open to receiving from your partner, especially if they're a male. And so to me, it's really just about being held and knowing my role in my relationship. And so whether it's before I was married or not, like the role that I want to be in as a woman is to be taken care of. I want to be pampered. I want to be fed the fruit as I'm laying down in the sun, like all those things, whether it's just this analogy or reality, you know, it's, I think it's really important to start again with this like uh, evaluation or inventory check of your life. It's like, okay, like how am I holding my masculine energy and how am I holding my feminine energy? And I still hold the masculine energy. I, I work out. I do a lot of, 
um, strength training, that's mas my masculine energy coming out. And then there's the friend side where I'm asking for help, even when I don't necessarily need it, but I just want it. And so I think that's kind of the shift that helped me come out of this like independent woman, I don't need no man phase was like, actually, I deserve that. Like I deserve to be held. I deserve to be supported. I deserve for somebody to come fix my electricity. I don't have to do it myself. Like whatever that is for you listening to this today, like you deserve that. You're worthy of somebody supporting you, even if you actually can do it yourself. So Yeah, because Mrs. LP is like, you know, when you get done today, I need you to turn up the hot water in the hot water tank. So can you take care of that baby, honey, please? I was like, oh yeah, I definitely would do that. <laughs> so, yeah, and, yeah. you know, see, because to me, I always, and I know we're laughing and joking, but like we're serious because I always say to people, every day I'm a continuous work in progress. And again, far be from your brother LP to be the caveman, knuckle dra dragon, Neanderthal dinosaur. I want to do everything that I can do to minimize domestic violence in my household. People think that the DV is all about the physicality. And it's not like the old saying sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I wish I could find the person that came up with that because I would hit them with a water balloon, probably a bunch of, with some ink in it. I'm just saying words hurt and they hurt like hell. I think for us, as we're talking about healing generational and ancestral trauma, and right now we're talking about heterosexual relationships in the month of June, which is what we're in now. This is Pride Month. What do you say to those in the LGBTQ community as far as the modalities for healing and healing ancestry and generational trauma in that community? Yeah, that's a good one. And I consider myself a part of that. So I am bisexual. I don't really like put it out there as far as like my label. I don't really identify as anything other than who I am. Like I'm just Simone, you know, and I have many roles. I have many expressions of who I am. Um, and in that space, in the context of the LGBTQ community, um, I think it's almost the same, like we're all human, right? And there's just some complications to that when we're talking about sexuality, but when we're talking about ancestral and generational trauma, we're all the same. Like we're all the same. We all have, we all come from ancestors. We all come from people who come from before us who pass down baggage that we carry around that's not ours. And so it's each and every one of our responsibilities to see that, to uncover that for ourselves and then move past it. And that's what we're talking about today, right? Those modalities. And so the same modalities for a straight person is it's gonna be the same modalities for somebody who identifies as gay or lesbian, bisexual, whatever. A really important piece I think to understand too, because like you said, we're in Pride Month and there's, I find value in all these months, like Black History Month, uh, Latino Month, all these, I, I find value in it, in the celebration part, but there's also like an underlying divisiveness in that. And so we have to, it's like a very, very fine line between the celebratory and the, and the division. Um, and so in that is why I wanted to, you know, really emphasize that it's the healing is the same for all of us. It doesn't matter what our skin color is. It doesn't matter how we identify what we do in the bedroom, whatever it is, like we all are human beings and we all are energetic beings, spiritual beings who are connected to this, this journey of being human. Um, and so when it comes to different modalities of, of healing, especially, especially with ancestral and generational healing, because it's so deeply rooted in each and every single one of us, the healing is pretty much the same. Why right? it could look differently for each person, but it can work the same for each individual. If that makes sense. I want to get more deep into that because again, this is Pride Month, and for you being part of the LGBTQ community, what do you say to because you have a son? What do you say to your son in terms of teaching him i want to help eliminate generational ancestral trauma in my household from the community that you're in what what do you do to help him not face that deal with because i know he's uh, still pretty young right now so how, what are those things as a mom who is also part of the lgbtq how do you help him learn about those situations that you you've encountered mm -hmm. yeah i think the the first thing that i mean he, he is very young and we do have certain conversations and i think one that's like approaching a conversation that um, my husband and i have talked about 
is this idea that just because mom and dad have these set of values doesn't mean that he himself needs to take that with him for the rest of his life. And so of course my hope as a mother is to lay foundation, lay those family values, but also my like the reality is that he can change his mind about certain things that he's been doing for the last 15 years of his life. And then all of a sudden he's like, wait a minute, I don't actually like what you guys are doing, right? And so it's my then my responsibility to support him in that change or to give him shit for it, you know? And so what my perspective is, I'm hoping that when I'm in that space that I will give him support because that wasn't the case for me as I was growing up. When I started changing my belief systems that were different than my mom's, different than my dad's, I was met with a lot of resistance, a lot of shame. And so as a mother, no matter what he chooses, um, I will give him my opinion. And so like, yep, but you know, it's still your choice. And I think that's kind of how parenting should be a lot. Um, no matter how old they are, really. It's like, we can give our opinion. And if, if it's not a life-threatening situation or something like serious injury is gonna happen, give them my, like give them our suggestion and then say, but the choice is yours. And I think that's um, a really beautiful and powerful experience for children to be able to have that autonomy um, over their life in, in certain respects. Of course, that changes as the, the development progresses. Um, but ultimately, like I do that with my three-year-old. He'll be like, mom, can I climb that? And I'd be like, I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> I think that's like kind of dangerous. But you know, if he wasn't gonna like get impaled or anything, go for it. See, and he, he'll think about it. And sometimes even when I say I wouldn't do it, he will still do it. And I think that's kind of what life is, right? Like we can all, people listening to this podcast, they can take what we're saying or they can't, or they don't. And it, it's up to them. It's about, you know, freedom of choice, freedom of decision. Um, I'm really, I'm a huge advocate for cultivating critical thinkers and children. And so we can, again, we can give them information, we can give them facts, we can give them research, but it's ultimately their decision on how they take that, how they um, integrate that into their lives or not. As an applied epigeneticist, how does science in the, in the study of epigenetics that you have, because you're an applied behavior analyst, how do you approach situations from a scientific perspective in regards to like transgenders or hate crimes or, you know, even, and you don't have to talk about politics, but I'm just saying like for those that feel alienated from the church, quote unquote, air quotes, because of stuff that they see like in Christianity with the Old Testament and, and different things like that. How do you as a applied epigeneticists view those particulars? Mm. Yeah, I feel like there was like two questions in one. So I'm gonna start with just like the first part on like how um, how I perceive transsexuality or transgenders. And you know, it's, it's a really, really sensitive subject. So I'll preface by just sure. saying like, these are my personal beliefs, right? And this is um, also stemmed in biology. And then again, like another preface is that I. I am a holistic practitioner. And so for me, any surgery, I'm gonna start with surgery because not everybody who's transgender is gonna get a surgery, but I'm gonna start there. But in my opinion, any surgery that's not meant to save a life to me is unnecessary. And we're just gonna go broad, right? Cause that could be breast implants, that could sure. be a change of sex, whatever it is. I just, that's my personal beliefs and values because of my holistic background and just what I know that one little incision can do to your body. Um, and so, and then on the other side of that is the mental health perspective. And this is where I am like really firm in my belief when it comes to this. And I have loved ones. Um, one of my best friends, her son had that change and, and is now, was biologically her daughter and now is her son. And so I have people who I love and I, and I you know, I'm really aware of all of the nuances in this. However, at the deepest level of anybody who is going through this um, curiosity or questioning of their gender and their gender identity um, is really a mental health issue, in my opinion, um, because it typically starts with body dysmorphia and you're looking in the mirror and you're not liking what you're seeing. Um, and then there's another layer of that now with this new generation of children who see that they can be embraced if they decide that they're transgender because it's this whole um, I want to say almost like a movement right now where a lot of people in the transgender community are finding 
support, right? And they're, they're cause it's growing. And so if a lot of, if a young person is feeling lost in the world and they also don't like what they see in the mirror, then like, okay, well maybe it's just because I'm a guy or like, the opposite gender. And so I think it kind of starts there. And I think that in the last 20 years, we should have been prioritizing their mental health instead of prioritizing what their gender is and helping them get to what they want, what they think they want their gender to be. Um, and so it's really a mental health situation, in my opinion. Um, there's been a lot of interviews and um, talks about with people who have gone through that process as a child and now are adults and regret it. Um, and I'm not saying that's everybody, but there is a lot of health implications to being on hormones, not even just being on hormones, having those injections. There's so many health implications and side effects that a lot of providers aren't actually telling to these children or disclosing to their parents. Um, and Why so, is yeah, Why um, is I have really radical beliefs <laughs> on, and this is what you're saying. This is your interview. This is your yeah. interview. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You go right ahead. Yeah. This is your interview. Yeah. This is my podcast. This is your interview. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think, I think there is, you know, there's been like a war on drugs, a war on this, a war on that. I really do believe there's a war on family unit. And in that in that war to create this different different rifts in the family system. So that goes back to schooling. Like I'm a huge advocate for homeschooling because I think that's part of the division, right? And the disconnection between a family. Um, and then this new layer of pushing um, transgenderism onto children, I think is a part of that. And, and it's so deep, it goes into so many levels. And I've talked to so many people who have um, contrasting views than I do. And we're able to sit down and have a plus conversation about it. Um, yes. I don't get like super heated about it, but I just know for me, um, you know, if my son were to come to me at 12 years old and say, hey mom, like I think I was actually supposed to be a woman. My first my first move wouldn't be like, okay, let's go get you a doctor and like set up your hormones. Like that wouldn't be my first, um, you know, step. It would be like, okay, like let's talk more about this. Let's get a therapist. Let's do all these different things to figure out what is the underlying issue here that even brought you to that place in, to begin with? And so I think if we take kind of like the psychological um, perspective avenue on this issue first, we could avoid a lot of the health implications that come with being on hormones and having surgeries and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, I really think that the push is hard right now. Like there's a lot of imagery. Um, there's a lot of campaigns um like with companies and commercials and all of that and i think it's always for a reason um you know there it's 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 working and so that's why you're seeing more of it um and i think it, then it goes back to again like this this family unit and having those family values and being able to unpack the ancestral and generational trauma because a lot of that with the mental health side of um we're talking about the trans community a lot of that is generational ancestral but for that individual their mental health manifested in body dysmorphia or you know progressing along those lines instead of maybe their aunt or uncle whose mental health um maybe was substance abuse or something like that and so we all have our different ways of coping with stressors and challenges and trauma and i think a lot of the times in the trans community their way of coping with their um distress and their trauma is through going that route and you know getting hormones and changing the way their body looks because they think that they're going to find peace when their body looks the way that they think it should look and often more often than not after they go through those changes their mental health isn't hasn't improved and so it's like we're missing that piece it's like okay we can change the way you look and just like without surgery without being trans you can cut off your hair you can do all these things but you know it's really about the internal it's not really about the external so much so what would you say in regards to Western medicine's modalities concerning generational and ancestral trauma? Ooh, yeah. So one, I don't think it's really talked about too much in that context in Western medicine. So, um, you know, my undergraduate degree is in psychology. I went through traditional Western medicine for years um, in my teenage and early twenties. Um, and you know, they might ask you questions about like, oh, like what was your childhood like and your parents? But it's really not that deep. Like I really don't think they go that deep unless it's somebody who's specializing in that area. The, the go-to method and go-to modality in Western psychology is pharmaceuticals. And I'm just 
completely the opposite of that. Um, I have been on a, a plethora amount of different antipsychotics, antidepressants, um, and I'm not saying just because it didn't work for me, it won't work for somebody else. And I do think it's there is sure. a place for that. If there's somebody in a life threatening situation, like they're in it, they're in it, it's definitely can save lives. Um, but as far as chronic use, um, I think it does us a disservice actually. Um, because it almost like puts a band-aid over whatever the issue is. And then you're like, okay, right. the band-aid's there. I don't see the cut, it's not bleeding, so I'm good, we're gonna move on. But really, again, there's no work in that, in the, the roots of whatever is happening. And so if you're relying on a pharmaceutical to get you through your day, it's like, you're not actually thriving. You're surviving, you're in survival mode still. Um, and so when it comes to ancestral generational trauma, again, if we're not getting to the root of that, and it's not like the root of ancestral generational trauma means we have to like, know what our ancestors went through um that is sometimes impossible especially if you're dealing with somebody who's been adopted or something like that um but it's really just about noticing the patterns that are in your life that no longer serve you and that could could have been passed down from previous generations and so for me again with um like western medicine and it's not all it's like i don't put the blame on the actual providers necessarily some maybe yes <laughs> but majority of i think come from a good spot like they really are trying to help people um and the system is just not set up for that success they only get a certain amount of time where they can be with the person kind of an in and out situation there's a lot of money involved with big pharma um there's just so many layers to that that i think people um aren't really getting the help that they need and actually deserve so i want to jump to the next part of that question which is your thoughts on the metaphysical perspective regarding these modalities to help people deal with generational and ancestral traumas from your epigeneticist mind and your behavior analyst mind. Yes. Okay. So the biggest thing here, um, for those of you who might not know what epigenetics is, it's the study of how our lifestyle choices and habits influence the way our genes are expressed. And so you can think of your genes of, as having a light switch, right? And so you can turn that gene on or you could turn that gene off based off of the things that you do in your life, the things that you're consuming, whether it's food, sound, like music, media, like whatever it is, water quality, air quality, all these different things. Um, and so in that context, when there is, when, when ancestral and generational trauma is present, meaning that there's something that one of your parents, grandparents, somebody in your ancestral line has gone through that you are also going through. So it's been passed down. And with that, it's actually getting passed down in your DNA. And so research has shown that these traumas actually create shifts in your DNA. And so then that will get passed down when gestation happens, pregnancy, and so on. And so what we can do actually is to create a certain set of habits in your life to turn those light switches off that are causing alcoholism, substance abuse, suicide ideation, all these different things. And so it's really um, in that line of thinking. And I think ultimately it's really important. It's really like really, really important to take ownership and radical self-responsibility for what we're doing, for, for what we're really doing in our life. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the different modalities that are in the metaphysical, I think the first part, part to wrap your mind around is that we're not these physical bodies. Like we are so much more than this. We are actually energetic beings, spiritual beings who are who come here in this physical form, right? But if you look at quantum physics and you and you understand the breakdown of our muscles, our tissues, our cells and go, and going down like this to the subatomical particles, we're actually mostly energy. And what we're seeing, what we're feeling is only like 0.1% of who we are as humans. And so that's why I think spiritual practices and medical physical practices actually create more potent changes for us and improvements in our health. It's because of that, because we are mostly energetic. As somebody saying to me like, whoa, like that was like way too much for me. Um, I think another visual that I can give you is like, if you look at an atom, right? We're all familiar with atom, atom makes up the cells. If we look at an atom under a microscope, what we see are three subatomical particles, the protons, neutrons, and electrons bouncing around, right? You can see that. The majority of what you're seeing is actually nothing, right? It's just space, energy, ether. And so if 99.99% of what you're seeing when you're looking at an atom under a microscope is just 
energy space, that means that 99.999% of who we are is also energy. And so that's why I think it's so beautiful when people can tap into things like meditation, breath work, frequencies, whether it's sound bowls, whether it's this Healy technology, whatever it is, to support your energy being, your spiritual being, because that's going to create a ripple effect into your mental, your intellectual, your emotional, and to your physical. It's all connected. I want to move over a little bit still under the metaphysical modalities because you talk about some of those things. What other metaphysical modalities do you recommend or believe are very helpful for people dealing with ancestral generational trauma? Yes. So I'll start with the one that I personally started with. So when I started my healing journey, especially when it was with ancestral generational, mostly generational coming from like my father, um, a lot of the work that I was doing was in silence and was in meditation. And meditation isn't just one thing where you see somebody sit with the best posture and that's not the only way you can meditate and that doesn't work for everybody um you know and so there's like you can even search in your search engine um top 10 ways to meditate and you'll see 10 very different ways people meditate and dance right like there's so many different things that you can do to meditate and for me that was how i really started my journey because i was able to get clear i was out in nature so nature healing is um one of my fortes and something that I advocate for for everybody. But being in silence with your thoughts and getting to know yourself improves your self-awareness. And so when you improve your self-awareness, then you can really get clear on who I am, who am I as a person and what do I do that's actually not for me or not the best for me, I should say. Um, and so in meditation, these things can be um, revealed to you and then you can go further into that you know, realization. So if you're sitting in meditation, and you're like, oh, like I've been coping using these um, unhealthy coping mechanisms and you're in meditation, meditation, right? And you're like, oh, wow, like this is actually what I can do. You know, I remember when I was a kid and I used to love, um, you know, skipping rocks. Well, maybe every time I get anxious, I'll just go find, you know, my river and skip some rocks, right? Like that could even be a meditation in itself. And so there's just so many different ways that we can connect to our energy being and meditation is just one of them. Um, so that was like the first thing that I started with and I can kind of jump timelines into the most recent thing that I've started working with, which is frequency technology. And when I started learning about frequency technology, I realized that I had been working with frequencies even before the tech came into my life because music, sound, that's frequency. Like even if you're watching this podcast right now, you're listening to our voices, that's frequency. And so it's really beautiful to be able to understand that about frequency so you're not like afraid of it or have this like you know stigma attached to it um and so when i realized that i had been actually working with frequencies pretty much my whole life and that frequencies can either be beneficial or detrimental and so there was many many times where i had been in like deep depression and then i'll turn on like billy eilish and i'm just like just like so angry and sad and just like ah like ah, you know and that was lowering my my vibration it was lowering my frequency and now I don't do that, right? I haven't, I haven't listened to her music in so long because it's so low vibrational for me and takes me to that place where I, you know, that was associated with when I was in my deepest, darkest depressions. And so you can use frequencies for music and turn on something that's more uplifting, um, whether for you, if you're religious, it could be gospel music. If you're like me, spiritual, it could be something that's just like, you know, indie or whatever it is. It could be anything that just makes you feel great and that has good lyrics or um, anything like that. And then another frequency work that I have done is with sound bowls. And so there's different sound bowls. It could be crystal bowls, it could be copper bowl, and that emits a frequency into your atmosphere. It gets absorbed into your energetic being and it can make shifts. And so with frequency technology, like this Healy device here, um, you know, it's making it more intentional. And so what I found with the Healy frequency device is that when it comes to ancestral and generational trauma, there's a feature called scan. So it's um, a bioenergetic scan that basically scans your entire entire bioenergetic field. That means your physical matter, your aura, which is like two, three feet around you. Um, and it's really uncovering layers that you might not be aware of. And there's some in the report that you'll be aware of. But really what it does, it can give you an implication on what work that you need to do or what support your being needs in order to move past whatever challenge is going on, whatever trauma that you're stuck in. And so for example, when I first got my Healy, I'm I'm a very like I'm a very passionate person. So when I when I get into something, I'm like 
full on. And so when I did my first scan, I was, it was actually really jarring for me. Like it actually took me quite a few days to process the results that came up. Um, because one of the results that came up in my first scan ever doing using my Healy was one of the themes. So there was five themes that came up. And one of the themes said, basically alluding to the fact that I needed to express more love to my father. My father has been dead since 2015. And so I was just like, what does that even mean for me? And so as I was unpacking this on an ancestral level, I was like, oh, that actually makes so much sense from knowing my mother's story on her relationship with her father and my even just the, the little bits and pieces that I know about my dad and his relationship with his father, that there's actually a reoccurring theme on both sides of my family, the maternal side and the paternal side with relationships with the father figure. And so when I read that report, I started doing some journaling on it. I was like, wow, like I can understand why there's some blockages within me pertaining to my father, even though he's deceased. And so then I started working on that. Just, I, I wrote, I remember, um, it was like two weeks after I told you, it took me a while to really like soak this in because it was so jarring for me. But around like week two after that, I was able to do a letter to my dad. And I've done this before in the past, but this time it felt different. It felt like I was writing to him with love. And that's, that was my intention. I'm being like, I understand like that, that what you did was the best that you could do. The only thing you knew how to do in, in, in that line. And so for me, what the frequency device does is not only does it send the exact frequencies that you need to support those shifts in yourself, also gives you an avenue to, to do the work on your own, right? So it's not just like, oh, run the frequencies and boom, you're going to be better. It's like actually gives you the opportunity to have focused intention on your healing. So when you are meditating, so when you are journaling, when you're doing crystal work, whatever else that you're doing, if you're going to go see a Reiki healer or whatever it is in the metaphysical, you can have more intention. And so that's why I love the Healy devices because it, it illuminates things that we might not be aware of that we can work on, um, sends you those exact frequencies that you need, but then opens up this whole avenue for you to go deeper into whatever is coming up from the results on the report. Um, and so that's like, to me, it's like my Healy device has been like the ultimate metaphysical tool because it can I can connect to spirit, connect to source or God, whatever you believe in. Um, also to myself, I use it on my entire family. Um, and I also send my sister. So this is one of the things that's really important for me. I think we've talked about it in part one, um, yeah. is that my mom and my sister are the two closest people to me and my family. Um, my mom started her holistic self-healing journey um, a few months after I did several years ago. However, my sister hasn't really stepped into this world. And a few years ago when I relinquished control and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to try to force her to heal. Like you can't do that. Somebody has to be willing to do that on their own. But what I did do is I asked her for consent. I said, Hey sis, do I have your consent? Can I send you frequencies? And she said, sure. I don't really know what that it means, but sure. <laughs> right. So I was like, okay, cool. So I was able to actually do a scan on my sister and she's in Washington state. I'm in Florida. So this is like across the entire country of the U S I was able to actually do a scan for her see the report, send it to her, and then actually send her those exact frequencies that she needed in that moment in time. And so another reason why I think the Healy is so amazing for ancestral generational trauma is because with the consent of your loved one or your family member, you can actually send them frequencies no matter where they are in the world. And so this for me, this is also really neat for my son, right? Because right now, I mean, he's pretty much with me all the time, but as he's growing up, you know, if he's with his friends or doing whatever, I can actually send him frequencies to protect him or to, you know, help create more harmony in his body and his mental from afar. And so I think it's just one of the most beautiful tools that we have as humans um, the access for. And it's only four years young, been on the market for four years. So it's still a startup in the startup phase. There's going to be so much evolution and growth in this because of who the founders and the creators are and, and their vision for what this is. So, ah, yeah. Yeah. What do you think LP? I'm fascinated. I'm telling you, I, I'm really fascinated. And I want people to understand that when we have these discussions on the trigger, want to talk podcast, it's no holes barred. We're not striving to hurt anybody's feelings. We're not attempting to offend anybody or hurt anybody or activate anybody's trauma intentionally in terms of we want you to be re-triggered and all this stuff. However, we call it the Trigger One Talk podcast because we cover these things with uncensored conversations. We give you all kind of, you've given us 
so much information and resources that if you are activated from some of the things that we've talked about in this part three or you talked about your story in part one and also part two where we covered all that you need to know about it was a whole tutorial on ancestral generational trauma you know you don't have to listen or watch these podcasts in its entirety i have people that i've interviewed simone that have never watched their interview to this day and they'll they'll reach out to me and they'll say you know what lp i just can't do it i'm, I'm not ready i mean i was ready to, to talk about it i'm ready to share my story i i, I can't watch it you know uh one lady who is rated number one on her interview she had her mom watch it and that took some time you know and her mom was like i didn't i wasn't aware of some of these things i want to be able to have these discussions with action plans not only with the professionals with the non-professionals because that young woman is not a professional she's a mental health advocate but she's not a, a licensed degree or certified individual she just has an incredible story about being a survivor of sexual based offenses and domestic violence. You know, she was raped repeatedly by her stepdad, you know, as a little girl, you know, through her teens. And she has such a powerful story. We got to have these damn discussions. And I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of not knowing the stuff that I need to know. And I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of the stigmas and the taboos and the fucking stereotypes regarding traumas or adverse childhood experiences or domestic violence, whether it's intimate partner violence or human sex trafficking. And I can go on and on and on and on and on. There is too much damn information out here. And there are too many people like yourself, Simone, who are trained professionals who you ain't telling us what you heard. You're telling us what you know. It makes a difference. And I, I don't make no apologies about it. I don't. And I'm not. I'm not. I take this information and my mission is to go to other first responders and say, do you know this stuff? Do you know about this stuff? Because as a first responder, I did EMS and fire. We got probably 40% of our 911 calls for mental health related shit. It wasn't just fire suppression and bumps and bruises and gunshots and heart attacks and, and strokes and car accidents and all of this stuff. You talked about medications. <laughs> We're the real street pharmacists as a paramedic. I talked I talk to Dr. Maisha recently and, and I interviewed her. I said, Dr. Maisha, do you know what the technical term for a paramedic is? She was like, no, because she's a medical doctor. The technical term for a paramedic is physician surrogate. Physician surrogate. She was like, wow, I never knew that. A medical doctor, my license is un and everybody that's an EMT, basic all the way to a paramedic like me, we work directly under a medical doctor's license. I've given how dog. You talking about antipsychotics? I've administered those things. I've administered stuff like Ativan. You know, I've administered other anticonvulsants. I've administered other drugs to help people that were having mental health crisis. All the PAMs, the Lorazepam's, the Ativan's, and all of these different things when people were flipping the fuck out for whatever the reason was, whether it was a bipolar issue or schizophrenia issue, whether they were on some, some psychoactive drug like a PCP or a LSD or whatever it was from K2 to crack to meth to fentanyl to weed to you name it. I've done it. I was giving out Narcan like it was Tic Tacs. I'm going to move on though, because that's a whole nother conversation. I just want to thank you so much. And I want to I want you to talk about one other thing that popped in my head. I want you to talk about from a behavioral analyst and an epigeneticist, people who are in foster care and adoptees, what modalities do you think really works for them to help them deal with generational and ancestral trauma? Because if anybody has it, and I'm speaking from experience because Mrs. LP was born into the foster care system and she was in it 
from birth to she got finally adopted by her family who still is her family to this day at the age of six. She down there four, they finalized the adoption at six. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's such a difficult situation when we're talking about like accessibility, right? Like there's the element where if you are, if you come from that system, if you came from that background, more likely than not, you didn't have access to a lot of these like metaphysical principles and, and, and situations. And so the important thing I think to remember is that if you are adult and you came from that space, that it's not too late to start now. And so, you know, really getting the opportunity. So giving yourself the opportunity to show up in a different way. So I was actually on Clubhouse um, not too long ago and somebody was sharing this how they they speak to their daughter who had been sexually abused and they always talk to their daughter in this way of like that was a chapter of your story that is not your entire story and so if you're listening to this and you are um you know you came from the foster care system or you were adopted um it's up to you to change the trajectory of your story and so again with this piece of radical responsibility that i'm so passionate about is if you're listening to this and now you might have accessibility that you didn't have before. So now is time for you to start approaching these different things and get on YouTube and listen to a meditation. And, you know, it could be like if you're dealing with something like um, su substance abuse, you can even try to search that and like see what comes up meditation for substance abuse. And it could be just somebody, a guided meditation where somebody is telling you, like, you no longer depend on this, you no longer need this, whatever it is. And you're just focusing your attention on those words. Um, and so the accessibility piece is really important. And then of course, ed education. So that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, so listening to things like this is amazing. Um, you know, doing searches, going on, if you're on social media, being able to you know, maybe look at, look up in the little search box, different hashtags about what things that can really help you and support you. Um, but I think ultimately get, having the awareness that the only person or the only thing that you need to make you whole is you. So you don't have to have crystals. You don't have to have a Healy device. You don't have to, you know, outsource your healing to anything or anybody. If you have the will, there is a way for you to create healing in your life. Um, and, I, and I really truly believe that most of all, all of healing, I can go as far as say all of healing starts right here. And if you can't see me, I'm pointing to my mind, my brain. It starts with your mindset. It's just so important because once, and I think another layer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewind a little bit and say another layer to this, and not just for people who come from the foster care system or who have been adopted, but for all of us, one of the most important things that we can realize is that the progression that we make with healing or not healing has everything to do with our self love. So how we honor ourselves and how we think of ourselves is so important when it comes to our healing. Because if we think we're not worthy of living a healthy, optimal vitality, like all of these things, if we don't think we're worthy of that, we're not gonna ever get there. And so it starts with being having that self-love and knowing that you're worthy of optimal health and happiness for your life. And that's anybody, no matter what background you come from, no matter how you identify, whatever it is for you, to have optimal health and happiness, you have to know that you deserve it. Final thoughts. My question to you would be, some people think that metaphysical modalities are fruitful science. They think it's snake oil salesmen. They think, you know, you're on some, you know, otherworldly type of shit or, you know, you, as you know, final thoughts on modalities for healing in generational traumas. The mic is yours. You. Yeah, so if you're listening to this and you think this is all woo-woo, foo-foo, bullshit, whatever it is that comes up to you and you're listening to this, um, my assumption would be that you're a really scientific person, right? So if you think that metaphysical is woo-woo, typically it's because you're really about the material, the science, okay, right? So let's then talk about peer-reviewed research. And now, I have different perspectives on this in general, but if that's what you need, it's out there. Like there's actually peer reviewed studies on meditation. There's actually peer reviewed studies on mindfulness practices. Um, you know, and there's actually over 20 specific articles about frequency technology and healing. So if you're interested on that, you can also find that. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, I, I've talked about this before in different spaces about 
a lot of people who question spirituality or woo woo stuff. Um, and it's really about the evolution that we have had and as humans. And now in modern society, especially in the Western world, we're all operating from our prefrontal cortex. So that's like that area right in between your eyebrows. Sorry. And that prefrontal cortex in our brain is all about our executive functioning. It's about logic. And so if we are, the majority of us, I believe, are operating solely from that space. And what I would like to invite you as you're listening today is to start creating balance in your life and start thinking and acting and being from your heart and your intuition. And so if you're like, oh, intuition in itself is woo-woo, <laughs> we need to have a different talk about that. But, um, you know, your intuition, your, your inner knowing is like your sixth sense, right? So we, we get taught these five senses in school and in, as we're growing up, but there's actually more than five. And one of those is your intuition. And so it's about discernment, right? And so if you're like, oh, like I need to have proof, 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 and you're always about this prefrontal cortex operation, you lose a lot along the way from your heart, what your heart is telling you, what your intuition is telling you. And so if you're like, oh, like I've always been interested in meditation, but then every time I think about it, emphasis on the think, I'm like, oh no, it doesn't work. So instead, the opportunity here is to just take a leap of faith and try it. You can try it for two weeks. I always give things two weeks, you know, as a trial period. Um, and if it doesn't work for you, then move on. And if it does, then there you go. You have a new healing modality for yourself that could really create change in your life. And so, again, it's, I, I'm a, another another thing that I'm an advocate for is self experimentation. So if somebody tells me, "Hey Simone, if you eat your toenails, you know, you can grow your your hair will grow ten ten more inches," and I'm like, "Oh yeah, I want my hair to grow." And I can either take their word for it or I could try it myself. Maybe for that, I might not do it. But you know, it's just all about <laughs> self experimentation and. Um, you know, letting yourself go there. So if it's not gonna hurt you, and the only thing it can do is help you, and there's no side effects. So most of these metaphysical practices, there's absolutely no side effects, as in contrast to a lot of things in the Western medicine um, space. And so if you're doing crystal healing, there's no harmful side effects. How's that hurt you? To... Yeah, how's that hurt you? <laughs> it's not, it's not. And you go to a Reiki master, you do meditation, None of it's gonna harm you. It might be like scary as fuck, and it might be really raw and tender to go to those places for yourself. But you know, that's that's when change happens when you go outside your comfort zone. So I think you should just give it a try. Whatever it is that's calling you in the metaphys metaphysical world, just give it a try. And I say, give it a try for two weeks. Two weeks, you know. Just two weeks. We talk about metaphysics all the time on this podcast. We started with that. We're going to continue doing that. I don't make any apologies about bringing metaphysicians onto this podcast to share that information because, again, you might look at it like some snake oil salesman. I was looking at uh, some old medicinal memes where like, they would show uh, these concoctions, these apothecary individuals which was the precursor to what we now know as pharmacists and some of the co concoctions that they would come up with oh my god it was insane some of the stuff that these for real snake oil salesmen but some of these western medical practitioners would come up with for healing different things different ailments and different things medicine is a practice we practice medicine it is not an exact science. You know, there's an exact science component. There's some mathematics involved. But even that component of it, because when you're dealing with doses and all that stuff or whatever, and, you know, if I got to administer fentanyl to somebody who fractured their ankle, that's a weight-based drug. And we use, uh, we use kilograms. We don't use pounds and different things like that. So I got to convert, you know, if you weigh... You know, 200 pounds, I got to divide 200 divide by 2.2. .2, and it's like, okay, so I'm going to give you 90 mic micrograms of this fentanyl. Or, you know, I might say, okay, well, you know, I'll go ahead and give you 100 because. So it's like it, you have to play around with the numbers based on the science. We're just saying, folks, that metaphysical modalities for anything, especially generational and ancestral trauma, give it a shot. 
You're not putting nothing in your body. You're not taking a pill. You know, you're not getting an injection, not an IM injection, not an IV injection. There's no inhaling, no intranasal injects, you know, uh, atomization going on. I can go on and on and on. No buccal, which is in the cheek. You know, you don't have to do a sublingual under the tongue. These modalities require none of that. None of it. And we're not saying that Western medications don't have its place. You talked about that earlier. We're just saying two weeks. It don't work on yeah. something else. And you can incorporate these. Uh, you don't have to just pick one. There are people that do Reiki and meditation. And they do. I've done some of this stuff on the podcast. I've done a tapping session. You know, the EFT I've done NLP on the podcast. I interviewed a woman who uses crystals and tarot cards to help people. She's been doing that for over 30 years. People love that episode because the first 15 minutes, all we did was talk about the misconceptions when it comes to witches and warlocks and all this stuff. She's like, look, I'm a Roman Catholic. I carry my words right to the church every time I get a chance to. I don't do the demonology. She broke down the pentagram versus the right side up. You know, she talked about all five points. You know, when this right side up represents earth, wind, fire, water, and spirit. You know, I mean, she was, she broke it down. The first 15 minutes, that's all we talk about, was getting rid of all of those stigmas and all this stuff. And then we jumped into her story and how she healed, helps people heal and overcome their aces or their traumas. Small note, I'm thinking we might have to do a part four. Let's do it. You know, I'm up for it. Cause, Cause, there's so much that I want to, I want to continue talking about when it comes to ancestral and generational trauma. I didn't even get into the money. I mean, we didn't even talk a, about the money. That's a, a whole little, uh, little teaser. Little teaser. What was the question? Maybe we'll leave it for part four. Or what was the thought? Because now in in these breaking news stories, especially, we got to do a part four. I'm sorry, yeah. We got to do a part four talking about the money in regards to generational and ancestral traumas because now we know a lot of states are working on reparation. Like California, they're, they're kind of leading the charge. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. In St. Louis, uh, Mayor Tashara Jones, who was uh, the first uh, African American female mayor that was selected, she's working on passing uh, uh, some legislation to get reparations for the citizens of the city of St. Louis, because St. Louis is his own county also. I mean, you can look and just Google reparations and you're going to get all kinds of conversations. We know critical race theory or CRT is a big issue. Uh, it's being banned in a lot of states. Uh, DEI, diversity in, uh, inclusion, that's a huge topic. People like uh, uh, Ron DeSantis, the mayor of Florida, you know, they're banning books. Uh, Amanda Gordon, who did the inaugural speech for Biden, uh, she's offering free books that are banned to people, all kind of stuff. I want to really get into the money and some of these breaking news stories about like CRT and and, and reparations and DEI and some of these things because they have a direct link to ancestral and generational trauma. They they go hand in hand. So that'll be yeah, so, part. Oh, totally. And, and you can't you can't talk about uh, CRT and now that I know DEI, you can't talk about those things without talking about ancestral generational trauma, which isn't being really talked about in mainstream at all. Um, or at least from my knowledge, I don't watch it, but from what my knowledge and my awareness is, it's not really being talked about. And so, um, you know, I think it's really important. And if you guys are like, oh, yeah, I want to I want to listen to this part four. We did talk a little bit about this in part two. So make sure you go back and listen to part two of this. We did talk on um, both system and CRT and a little bit in part two. I, I really want to get more into that, especially about the reparations part of it because the money is the source. I always say that the money is the source from A to Z. You can put any conversation, any topic, the money is the source. So we're going to really go into that in part four. But that's it. I just wanted to have you on to give us your educated opinion. 
bring us some facts and figures. Tell us what you think. I'm, I'm thankful that you have the candor and the compassion and the courage to talk about you, especially from a personal perspective. You know, salute to you, not only for doing that. I thank you for being open about your LGBTQ identity. This is Pride Month. I'm going to have to put this interview out this month. I'm just going to have to do it. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, we're this month, except for um, a week ago, we uh, did our part three with Leah Abraham on our stigma, taboos, and stereotypes. But today, um, people can uh, start looking at some of our interviews for this month, and we're going to be highlighting people in the LGBTQ community. Uh, Ramel Bentley is the first person that we uh, are talking to in his interview. Uh, it was scheduled to come out yesterday, June uh, 8th, but we had some technical difficulties. So uh, I'm just wrapping it up right now. Uh, so it'll be out either today or tomorrow. But um, we're going to have a number of people come on to talk about some of these issues that affect the LGBTQ community that are triggering. And if you want to listen to these podcasts, we're streaming on all major platforms. If you want to watch, you can go on Spotify or our YouTube channel, which is Pen and Pen and Consultant Solutions, LLC. That being said, I'm going to let you go get back to nature, your walks, your runs, your dancing. Go and do a little dance for because you always be dancing, girl. You be throwing down on your IG. You know, and uh, you just... <laughs> You, you just have fun because you only got one life. Where is it? Where is it? fun, play. That's a healing in itself. Play. So you know, you you. So since I'm, I'm closing out, I'm going to bring up your social media links for people that want to watch. They can see it, and they also I'll have your links as always in the show notes for this episode. We have her party and free IG page up, but. The majority of the stuff that she offers is on her link tree. And so, again, I'll provide the link tree link and her hard and free link. Also, um, she has a nice amount of freebies that are available on this link tree. So you definitely want to check that out. Simone Noful, you know, we got mad love for you here on the podcast. And I'm going to talk to Mrs. LP about this healing device also and that mat. So that's that's my assignment for this weekend. You and I are going to talk more about getting ready for this part four at a later time. But again, peace and blessings be upon you, and your family, and thank you for educating me and this audience. Again, it's my podcast, but it's always the guest interview. And don't ever feel like you got to censor yourself. All I ask is no matter how or what you want to talk about, no bigotry, and be honest. If any guests will do that, they can come on and talk about anything that we cover. Well, thank you so much, LP, for having me. As always, it's always such a pleasure. And whew, I can't wait to talk about a part four. It's going to be a good one. Um, yeah, it's fire. It's going to be some fire going on. I, you know what? I need to get you and Dr. Maisha together on it. We need to do a series just with the three of us. I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. That would be delightful. Yes. Yeah. Because she and I are doing a three-part or two, but that's we'll, we'll talk about it. I'm going to let you go. Get back to your day. Peace and blessing to you. You can go ahead and leave the studio, uh, but just don't close out because it'll finish uploading your episode. All right. Sounds great. Thank Peace. You. Take care, LP. Take care. All right, folks. That's Simone Nofu. We're going to switch over to the last part of the show, which is our missing persons component. Mrs. LP gave me a great, great story uh, about a young Asian Asian woman. Uh, again, her name is Chan Yin Lam. And let me bring her information up on the screen here. I want to play the news story also so you can watch it. You don't have to listen to me. Let's take a look. It has been a year since 15-year-old Chan Yin Lam was found dead in Hong Kong. 
However, conspiracy theories refuse to die down with the police and protesters now presenting and coming up with very different accounts of the teenagers' deaths. Let's first tell you about the case which has exposed the mistrust between Hong Kong's youth and the authorities. 15-year-old Chan was caught in a crossfire between the police and protesters in August of 2019. The teenager then released a video asking why she was being targeted. Chan further said that she was just out shopping. However, things took a different turn when Chan's naked body was found in the sea two days after she went missing in September 2019. They called it to be a case of suicide. However, protesters said that the 15-year-old was raped and murdered by the cops for participating in the anti-government demonstrations. What followed was a delayed investigation and most notably, Chan's college, where she was last seen before going missing, refused to release the full CCTV footage. It did do so after massive outrage by protesters and students. The video then showed the teenager roaming around the campus. And at some moments, she looked visibly disturbed. The 15-year-old has had a history of mental illness. Chan, who comes from a broken family, has been in and around, in and out of correctional homes. And her caretaker said that Chan had attempted suicide in the past as well. Now, Chan's mother also corroborated the social worker's claims. However, the findings failed to put an end to conspiracy theories, especially after a court ruled that the cause of death remained uncertain. The girl's mother has said that protesters have been harassing her. She said that she has been accused of siding with the authorities and lying about her daughter's mental health condition. Now, for more on this story, Richard Kimber is joining us live from Hong Kong. Richard, a very good afternoon to you. Now, tell us a little bit more about this case, the haunting death of Chan Yin Lam, which has sparked plenty of media coverage and conspiracy theories as well. So what do we know about this case so far and what kind of cover-up is being suggested at the hands of authorities? Well, it's now a year since this all took place and the coroner's inquest that tried to investigate in more detail exactly what may have happened ultimately concluded uh, without reaching a clear verdict. The jury uh, involved in that said that they could not ascertain clearly whether or not there was a suicide involved or um, an unlawful killing. And they did not want also to say that they conclusively felt that there'd been an accident. There simply was not enough evidence in this case. And what this represents really is the growing distrust between the public and the police and the public and the government with regards to so many of these cases that are somehow related to the protest movement in the last 18 months. In this case, very many conspiracy theories circulated very quickly because of a lack of information being made public by the authorities and by the university uh, where Chan was studying. And that basically helped to fuel this idea that something uh, might be being covered up. And that's very representative of what's been happening in Hong Kong in recent weeks, even now, where, for example, the mass public testing for the coronavirus here has been undermined by fears that many people in the public have had that actually data could be gathered by right. the Hong Kong government and passed to the Chinese government through this public testing. So this is how we're seeing that same sense of public distrust manifest itself even now. Right. Now, a year later, has there been any development in her case or have there been any further calls for reinvestigating the matter? And do we know if any further investigation will be done? Also, tell us a little bit about how this has exposed some deep issues in Hong Kong's authorities and how they operate. Well, at the moment, there's no suggestion that this case may be reopened or further investigated, but that has not stopped the uh, continued sense of frustration that many protesters feel towards this case and the fact that they don't feel it was properly handled in the first place by the police and by the government. Um, now the coroner has basically ruled uh, that it cannot reach um, a, a clear verdict on the case. There's not much more that can be done from uh, the investigative side as far as many people are concerned, unless, of course, more uh, evidence is presented. And that could include uh, more CCTV footage that so far has not been made available becoming available. That's something that some of the protest groups who still maintain that there's a conspiracy going on, they're ca still calling for that but no real suggestion of any further investigation. The bigger issue, as I say, is how this is exposing more uh, frustrations and distrust between the public and the government, not just in the case of the public testing for the coronavirus, but also in relation to other protest-related investigations, where, for example, there have been incidents tied up in protests that are only now coming to court and only now being investigated some six, nine, or even 12 months after they took place. And it's becoming very difficult now to really understand what may have happened nine months ago during the heat of what was often some very violent clashes between protesters and police. Right. All right, Richard, thank you so much for all your inputs on this story. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. That was the story of former missing, now deceased, Chan Yin Lam.
We cover these stories under the true crime banner or moniker, I should say, and we will continue to do true crime stories with missing persons components also, either exclusively or uh, in part, because 99% of the cases that we cover under true crime with missing persons are melanated folks, not Caucasian folks also, and it could be a runaway kidnapping or an abduction if they died under mysterious circumstances. And not just here in the States, we're talking worldwide. This, this happened in Hong Kong. So we don't have a problem covering that because we want to give the same media attention and energy to those stories also. For Simone Nofel, I want to thank you all for joining us on all these platforms, all the major platforms we're on. So you can watch them on Spotify and our YouTube channel, Pinch and Pending Consulting Solutions LLC. Please like, subscribe, and write a review. Live in awareness, never live in fear. We want you to take a CPR first aid, stop the bleed class, because it's not a matter of if or when and where a violent critical incident may happen, will happen, does happen, and this is even worldwide. And so to be helpful, because EMS and fire and police may not be able to help you immediately in those situations, especially if there's an active threat. Police are going to make sure that they neutralize that threat and then they'll come in and provide medical care if needed. You need to be trained to be an immediate responder. That's going to be somebody that has some medical training, like knowing how to use tourniquets, chest seals, learning how to do bleeding control, learning how to do CPR. If somebody's choking, if somebody has an injury, you know, those are things that are important. Somebody's in cardiac arrest, you need to know how to use an AED. We want you to be a by-doer instead of being a bystander. For the Trigger Woman Talk Podcast, LP out.